On the eve of your historic trip to the United States and to Cuba, we have gathered people in three U.S. cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, and McAllen, Texas, cities that I know you wanted to visit, but will not be able to. So right here, right now, a virtual papal audience. Take a look at Chicago at the Cristo Rey Jesuit High School. If they're Jesuit, they're good, right? In downtown Los Angeles. Let's take a look. And from Sacred Heart Church on the U.S. border with Mexico in McAllen, Texas. You can see it in their faces. They are so excited to see the Pope. And many in that church have just learned they will get to ask a question of the Pope right here today. Holy Father, as you can see, everyone is very excited. And we are curious if you have a message before your visit to the United States. Un saludo grande. A big greeting, a big greeting to the Catholic community of the United States and to everyone, all citizens of the United States. That's my message, an affectionate greeting. Muchas gracias. Holy Father, we want to take you now to Chicago, to the Cristo Rey Jesuit School. My colleague Tom Yamas is there with his students. Saluden, el Santo Padre. Tom, this is their moment with Pope Francis. David, thank you. Santo Padre, es un gran honor como católico y periodista ser parte de este cosa que es una cosa tan maravillosa en este iglesia ahora mismo. Guys, we are. We are. We are. Holy Father, as you know, we are here in Crystal Ray High School. This is a special place in Chicago. All the students here are so special. They live amid gang violence. They come from low-income neighborhoods, yet somehow they not only are overcoming the odds, they are beating the odds. Many of the men and women you see here will be the first in their families to attend college. They all have amazing stories, amazing journeys, but there are two young women we'd like you to meet. The first is Valerie Herrera, Valerie, if you can come up and talk to us. <laughs> Valerie is as beautiful as she is brave, and she wants to share her wonderful story with you, Holy Father. Hello, Holy Father. It is such a privilege to be talking to you. Since I was four, I started to get my vitiligo around my eye, and it was something that I didn't know what was happening, right? So once I started growing up, I didn't see it as a, such a big deal. But when I actually you know, started growing up and I started going to school, well, you know, I was picked on. I was bullied because of how I looked like. But with the help of my family, I was able to overcome it. And with music, which is something that I love ever since I was a child, I have been in the choir at my church with my mom and my family ever since I was a little girl. And from there, I was able to start singing, and my faith just grew there. And to this day, I'm still in the choir and I'm just, I think. Well, um, <laughs> music has always been something I was able to use to escape all the bullying and everything. It was just something that was helping me to show people who I really was. And it wasn't just, oh, just the girl that looks different from everyone else, but the girl that has a many talents and that is not just someone who looks different, but, but just a normal girl like everyone else. 
So I'm going to be the first one to go to college. Um, I plan to be a pharmacist, not really sure what I want, where I want to go. And so my question is, what are you expecting from us, the youth? What are you expecting us to do to be? Valerie, uh, I would like to hear you singing. May I ask of you to sing a song for me? Sure. <laughs> go on, go on. Junto a ti, María, como niño quiero estar. Tómame en tus brazos, guíame en mi caminar. Quiero que me eduques, que me enseñes a rezar. Hazme transparente, lléname de paz. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Uh, my first response to your question is that what I hope for from youth is for you all not to walk alone in life. That's the first step. I hope for many other things. That you feel encouraged to walk with the love and the tenderness of other people. That you find someone you sang to the Virgin to carry you in their arms, to walk hand in hand with you, to accompany us in life. Life is very difficult. It's difficult to walk alone. You get lost. You get confused. You can find the wrong path. Or you can be walking around in circles in a maze. Or the worst. You can stop because you get tired of walking in life. Always walk hand in hand with someone who loves you, someone who gives you tenderness. And you were singing that to Our Lady. To walk hand in hand with Jesus. To walk hand in hand with the Virgin. That gives you security. And the first thing I hope for from young people is that they allow themselves to be accompanied, but with good company, as in keep good company. In my country, there's a saying that it's better to be alone than in bad company. That's true. But walk accompanied. Each young person has to seek someone in life to help them along the path. This might be your father, your mother, a kinsman, a friend, a grandfather or a grandmother. Grandparents also give you advice. A teacher. But someone that will help you to face things in life. First, walk with company. Second, I hope that young people walk with courage. It was difficult for you just now to take the first step on that path when I asked you to sing for me. 
You were excited. You didn't know how. But you were courageous, and you took the first step, and you sang very beautifully. Keep singing. You sing beautifully. The courage to take the first step, the courage to move forward. Do you know how sad it is to see a young person who has no courage? A young person with a face of grief, an expression of grief, a young person with no joy. Courage gives you joy, and joy gives you hope, which is a gift of God, obviously. It's true that there are difficulties on life's path, many of them. Don't fear the difficulties. Be prudent, be careful, but don't fear. You have the strength to overcome. Don't be scared, don't stop. There's nothing worse than a young person who has retired before his or her time. I don't know what age people retire in the United States, but you can imagine a young person who's 25 years old who's retired terrible. Always move forward with courage and with hope. And if you ask God, God will give you that hope. That's my response, Valerie. And thank you for the song. Thank you, Holy Father. Valerie, thank you so much. So courageous. Holy Father, we want to introduce you to another young woman who is also incredibly courageous, who has dealt with some of the difficulties throughout her life. Alexandra Vasquez, if you can come up now. <laughs> Holy Father, Alexandra is only 17, but she has already lived through so much. She wants to share her journey with you now. Um, hello, Holy Father. Um, um, both of my parents, they are um, from Mexico. Um, and they, they came over here after they, um, they were married. And um, they've, they've always been like um, a great support for me. Um, um, ever since I was little, I can remember um, my dad was a really playful person. And he, um, he would take care of me during the day. So we would play all day because he worked at a restaurant. So in the afternoons, he would go to work. But my mom would be back from work because she would work during the day cleaning houses. So um, they were always around. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, when, when I was only five years old, My dad passed away when I was five, and it was really hard to accept that someone who was always there was never going to come back. And it's still really hard today because every day I think about him and I think about how a life would have been if he was still here. But I've always had my mom by my side, and she's. She's been a great motivation for me because, I mean, she was only 27 and she was left without a husband and a five-year-old daughter. And she had explained so much to me about how, why my dad was never going to come back and how everything was going to be okay. And she had to go out and, and work and... But the good thing is that 
she kind of became my best friend, I guess, because we would spend a lot of time together because it was just me and her. And I remember on Friday nights, um, she would buy Chinese food when she came home from work. And we would watch um, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and we, would eat <laughs> and we would eat Chinese food together. And I don't know, I thought, I think th that's like a good memory that I always have because even though it was really hard, my mom was there to make it better. So I always try to make him proud and, and try to make my mom proud because I know that she worked really hard for me to to be here today and um, and I always like really like helping people because like from the stories that I've heard about my dad, he always tried to help people. So I hope that I can make a difference in people's lives like I know he did. Muchas gracias, Alexandra. Go on by the path. God bless you. Alexandra and Valerie, thank you. And thank you, Tom. Now we go to our friends in downtown Los Angeles. We're in the shadow of tremendous wealth and privilege. We still find so many who are homeless and struggling to make ends meet. But as we can see, they are excited for their moment with Pope Francis. And in fact, in that room, many of them have just learned that they will, in fact, get a chance to talk with the Pope today. Cecilia. Su Santidad, saludos desde Los Ángeles. Estamos muy agradecidos de estar con usted en conversación hoy. We're so excited, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Voy a hablar en inglés porque hay algunos aquí que no hablan español. I'm going to speak English because there are a few people here who don't speak Spanish. Holy Father. The majority of the people here in the room with me today come from nine different shelters in this city. These are shelters that house the homeless and the destitute in Los Angeles. This is my friend Marcus here. He's one of them. He is 19 years old. Marcus told me that he has spent more nights living on the streets of this city than he can ever count until he moved into a shelter. Marcus is 19, and Marcus has dreams of becoming a singer and a songwriter, and Holy Father Marcus has a question for you today. Um, hi, Holy Father, it's, it's a great honor to meet you and to be able to speak with you um, and to represent all of the people, the young people here uh, who are without a home here in the United States. So my question for you, because um, I know why you're so important to me, uh, but why is this trip to America so important to you? For me, it's very important to meet with you all with the citizens of the United States who have your history, your culture, your virtues, your joys, your sadnesses, your problems, like everyone else. I'm at the service of all churches and all men and women of goodwill. There is something very important for me which is closeness. For me, it's difficult not to be close to people. When I approach people, as I am going to do with you, it's easier for me to understand them and help them along life's path. That's why this trip is so important. For me to draw close to your path and your history. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you. Holy Father, I have someone else, some very special people I would like you to meet. They're also the cutest people ever. <laughs> this is Rosemary and her daughters, Celeste and Alyssa. They were living in a shelter for a very long time, and they only recently moved into their very first apartment ever. Alyssa is 11 years old. She's a brilliant little girl, and she would like to tell you a little bit about herself. Your Holiness, it is so nice to meet you. I admire how humble you are. When I was living in the shelter, I used to see people with their families and fathers. 
And they used to walk to a big house and open the door. And they were all so happy. And I was walking to the shelter and I felt ashamed. I thought that I was never going to make it. I thought we were never going to get our own house or apartment. And I thought that I wish that I can be one of them and just have a father and have um, a big house. But I have my family, my sister, and my mom who really support me at times when I'm really sad. And, and I have an apartment and a dog named Chico. <laughs> And I really love all of them. If it's not a big mansion, I still have my family, and I still have everyone that I love. And this is Rosemary. Rosemary, what would you like to tell the Holy Father today? Yes, this Rosemary. Holy Father, I want to show you this, love. And um, it's hard for me to be a single mom. I struggle. And it's hard for me to hear my daughter tell me these things. She wished that it was different, that we were a family, and mom and dad, and we had a house to stay. And it hasn't been easy for me. I've made some mistakes as a person, as a mother. I felt guilty at times and ashamed. And, um, I just remember down deep inside my heart, I would remind Alyssa and Celeste and tell them, babe, it's okay, we're, we're okay. You know, we have each other and that's what's important, that we can still do it. And when I look at my daughter Alyssa and Celeste and I see how beautiful they've grown, they just inspire me to not give up. And I'm just very thankful. I had beautiful friends and families, even strangers, people from centers, um, guide me and help me and encourage me. I know I'm still scared, but every day I try and I, and I hope and I pray. And I just want to learn and still be teachable and not give up. And I just want to thank you, and I want to say I love you, and God bless you. Gracias, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary, for your testimony. I want to tell you one thing. I know it's not easy to be a single mother. I know that people can sometimes look askance at you. But I'll tell you one thing. You're a brave woman because you were capable of bringing these two daughters into the world. You could have killed them inside your womb. And you respected life. You respected the life you were carrying inside you. And God will reward you for that. He does reward you for that. Don't be ashamed. Hold your head high. I didn't kill my daughters. I brought them into the world. I congratulate you. I congratulate you, and God bless you. From all of us here in Los Angeles today, Holy Father, we thank you so much. Now let's go to Sacred Heart Church on the U.S.-Mexico border, McAllen, Texas, and Mariana.
Holy Father. This church, just five miles from the border with Mexico, has been a temporary refuge for tens of thousands of undocumented immigrants. Immigrants like Ricardo, who I want to introduce to you today. Ricardo, come on up here. Ricardo has been living in Texas since he was four years old, and today he wants to tell you his story. Good morning, Father. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's been uh, my childhood dream to, to meet you one day. Um, I came to the United States when I was four years old. Uh, my father believed that there was no future for me in Mexico. He believed that I needed, to, I needed something better in life. He brought me, me and my mom at the age of four. Uh, I did all my school here, uh, all my friends, everyone, all my family was, was left in my, in my home country. So I had to start from, from zero. Going to school here in the United States was, was fairly easy till after middle school. Uh, coming out of middle school, I didn't really understand what it was to be an immigrant child. I didn't understand that because I was born on the other side of a border that life would be different for me. At the age of 16, 17, my dad had an accident. He almost lost his leg and wasn't able to work. That happening impacted my life very, in a very deep way. I had to become the breadwinner of the family. I had to be the person that supported our family. Having to support a family of six and having four younger brothers look up to you really made it hard on me. That being said, I never lost faith. I never lost the strength that my father and my mother gave me. I made sure that that motivated me to keep doing my best. When it came to, to graduate high school and go to college, it seemed like everything was falling into place. I was going to, to my dream college. I was going to, to have the future that I thought about and that I dreamed about. When it, when it got time to, to head out to college, uh, they informed me that I wasn't able to attend the university of my dreams because I wasn't a United States citizen. That being said, my father still told me, you know, Ricardo, I want you to go to your, to your school. I want you to have that education that I didn't have. I ended up going to a community college, started working full time, and started supporting my family. I have a question for you, Father. It's with all these problems in the world, the poverty, our education system, and immigration itself, what do you feel is the solution to this problem? Thank you. Evidentemente que clearly, listening to your story, I can tell you that life made you a father before your time because you had to support your family from a very young age while your father was Pero ill, but you knew how to do it because you had a father who had the courage to initiate you along that path of work and struggle and the courage afterward to put you in school with great sacrifice. There are many injustices in this life. And as a believer, as a Christian, the first one to suffer those, I'm telling you, who embodies them all in himself was Jesus. Jesus was born on the street. He was born as a homeless person. His mother had nowhere to give birth to him. Always look to the figure of Jesus. You ask me about the how. In looking to the figure of Jesus, we take one more step forward. God sometimes speaks to us with words, as he tells us in the Bible, his word. 
God sometimes speaks to us through gestures throughout history in various situations. And God sometimes, many times, speaks to us through his silence. When I see the question you ask me, the number of people who experience hunger, who don't have the means to grow, who don't have the means to tend to their health, who die as as children, who can't afford an education, the number of people who have no home, the number of people, we see it now, today, who emigrate from their country looking for a better future, and so many of them die along the way. I see Jesus on the cross, and I discover God's silence. The first silence of God is on Jesus' cross. The greatest injustice in history, and God stayed silent. Having said this, I'm going to be concrete and answer on another level. But don't forget that God speaks to us through words, through gestures, and through silence. And what you ask of me can only be understood in God's silence. And God's silence we only understand when we look at the cross. What to do? The world has to have greater consciousness of the fact that exploitation of one another is not the path. We are all created for friendship in society. All of us bear responsibility for everyone else. No one can say, this is as far as my responsibility goes. We are all responsible for everyone. To help each other out as best we can. Friendship in society. That's what God created us for. But there's a very ugly word that also appears on the first page of the Bible. God says to the devil, to the father of the lie, to the serpent, I will create enmity between you and the woman. And the word enmity grew over time. And a short time after that, the first enmity between brothers, Cain slays Abel, the first injustice. And after that, war, destruction. After that, hatred. Speaking in soccer terms, I would say to you that the game is played between friendship in society and enmity in society. And each one has to make a choice in his or her heart. And we have to help that choice to be made in the heart. Escaping it through addiction, through violence, does not help. Only closeness and giving of myself all that I have to give the way you gave everything you could as a boy when you supported your family. Don't forget that. Friendship in society, as opposed to the proposal of the world, which is enmity in society. You take care of yourself and let the other person take care of themselves. That is not God's plan. That's what I can think of to say to you, and also to express my admiration for you. Life turned you into a father before your time. So when you actually become a father and you have your own children, keep educating them 
and Gracias. bring them along the path that you learned from your father. Thank you. Gracias, Padre. Thank you, Holy Father. Now, Holy Father, as you may know, this church where I'm standing right now turned its parish hall into a welcome center for more than 20,000 immigrants from Latin America. That effort was spearheaded by Sister Norma Pimentel, seated here, whose work I want to acknowledge today. But also seated here with me today are several mothers and their children who just crossed into the United States. And I want to tell you some of their stories. First, I want you to meet Vilma. Come here, Vilma. Vilma came from El Salvador, Holy Father. And she was apprehended for crossing the border illegally. She now has to wear this electronic ankle bracelet that you can see here, put by the Border Patrol to keep her from fleeing. And she says she came here seeking a better life for her small son, Ernesto. Vilma, tell the Holy Father about your son's condition. Cuéntale al Santo Padre sobre la condición del pequeño Ernesto. Well, my son has had a problem since birth. He was born with his eyes like this. He has a congenital condition. Um, he has cataracts in his eyes. He can't see well with his eyes. Vilma, ¿le quieres pedir una bendición al Santo Padre? Sí, por favor. Yes, please. Would you give my son your holy blessing so that his eyes could be cured? Lo bendigo de todo corazón. Bless him with all my heart. Thank you, Holy Father. Gracias, Vilma. Gracias, Ernestico. And finally, Holy Father, I want you to meet Wendy. Wendy, come here. I would like to say one word. There was a sister there from a religious order. I want to see her. Hermana Norma. She was hidden there among all the people. Sister. Sister, I want to thank you. And through you, I want to thank all the sisters of religious orders in the U.S. For the work that you have done and that you do in the United States. It's great. I congratulate you. Be courageous. Move forward. Take the lead. Always. I'll tell you one other thing. Is it inappropriate for the Pope to say this? I love you all very much. <laughs> I want to introduce you to Wendy. Wendy is 11 years old, and she just made a 26-day journey with her mother, Ennis, from El Salvador. She wants to tell you a little bit about what she had to go through. Cuéntale al Santo Padre lo que viviste. We came from El Salvador with my mom because it was too dangerous with the gangs. Y en el camino, Wendy, ¿qué viviste? We were starving. Dormíamos en monte con mi mamá. Slept in the mountains with my mom. A mi mamá la estaban amenazando. They were threatening my mom. Y yo en la pasada del río. And passing through the river. Casi me ahogo porque la bolsa se quería dar vuelta. I almost drowned because the bag almost flipped over. Pero ya llegaste. But she's here now, Holy Father, and she. Even after everything she went through, she made a drawing for you. Muéstrale al Santo Padre lo que le hiciste, Wendy, lo que le dibujaste. Cuéntale. 
Cuéntale qué hay en tu dibujo. Y su corazón. It's a heart, and I also drew you, my mom, and me. Y de un sol. I drew a sun, clouds. Y puse, te quiero, papá. I love you, Pope. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holy Father, and on behalf of everyone here in La Iglesia del Sagrado Corazón in McAllen, Texas, thank you for addressing us today. Muchas gracias. The bravery inside that church on the Mexican border, and they waited so long to see if they would get the opportunity to communicate with the Pope, and now they have. Thank you to everyone there at Sacred Heart Church. Do you have a message for America before your visit, a parting message? I'm full of hope to meet you all. I pray for you all for all of the people of the United States. And I ask you, please, to pray for me. Thank you. Santo Padre, le agradezco por su tiempo. Y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Santo Padre, su santidad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's incredible.